So I am uh, Alaric Christian Montenon. I'm uh, <clears throat> a researcher at the Cyprus Institute. I've been here for nine years so far. Um, at the Cyprus Institute, I'm mainly working on the Fresnel collector that we had to visit. I hope we can make it on, on Thursday due to the weather conditions. I'm also involved of the part of the microgrid of Proteas, so that we are going to visit tomorrow. So here is Proteas, as seen from drone. So you can see that uh, there is an heliostat field, so mirrors, 50 mirrors in front of a tower. So that was the original plan of Proteas. But as you see, there are other systems, the microgrid. So there are two parabolic stirling dishes, one wind turbine, some PV, uh, PV arrays that we don't see on yet, but we're going to see them. There is forward osmosis. So this is where we're going to go tomorrow. So uh, PROTEA stands for the Platform for Research, Observation, and Technological Applications in Solar Energy. It is located by the seashore, as you see. There are not many facilities uh, for desalination that are by the seashore. And you have the fact sheet there uh, on the left. So 50 your stats, 150 kilowatt thermal uh, capacity. There is also a weather station, and um, and as mentioned before, there is a microgrid. So initially, uh, Proteas was conceived as the schematics on the left. So a solar field, heat is produced, stored in a big thermal storage unit. Then we either use it for desalination or for to produce electricity with the turbine. So this is what you see also, also on the left. So uh, you can see here the heliostat, the solar rays going to the heliostat, then focusing everything on the ISTO, which is the name of the receiver there, then sending the heat to the thermal storage unit, and afterwards there is a classical Rankine cycle. And as you know, a, a Rankine cycle needs a stage of condensation, so usually active cooling, and in our case, instead of using active cooling and then uh, wasting water or electricity for that, we plug a desalination unit, MED, so we desalinate water at the same time. So it was a cogeneration between uh, electricity and desalination of the water. So regarding Cyprus, so Cyprus, as mentioned before, uh, Cyprus is an interesting case because it's both an island and both a country. So it's very interesting to ha use it as a test bed for, uh, let's say, larger scale simulations. So uh, in 2020, the, um, um, the, the consumption of the EU 27, uh, meaning the 27 countries, uh, the primary energy consumption was almost 16,000. This morning we had another presen presentation, 17 terawatt hours. Um, so, but more or less we are in this range. And the annual uh, primary energy need in Cyprus is 26 terawatt hour. So it's almost nothing uh, compared to the rest of Europe. Mm -hmm. So now if we consider the direct solar radiation, the one that is really uh, seen from at least when, not clear sky, but let's say at least when the sun is uh, without cloud, is 19,000 terawatt hour. So as you can see, there is more solar direct uh, radiation coming from the sun on the island than the primary energy use in Europe. So this is tremendous. And it represents more than 730 times the needs of Cyprus in terms of primary energy, not final. So it means that it has really huge potential. Uh, as far as for the wind, so you saw that we have upgraded with PVs and with wind. So for the regarding the wind resource, uh, the rectangle you see here basically is a bit more than 38,000 square kilometers. Uh, and the island itself is uh, 9,000, a bit more uh, thousand square kilometers. 
It has 648 uh, kilometers of co coastline, and what you see here is the wind resource at 100 meters. So um, globally, on on this rectangle here, uh, we can uh, we can consider that there is almost 10 terawatt hour per year. This is mm, less than the primary energy consumption of the Republic of Cyprus. So the sun has a tremendous potential. The wind has, has good potential, but cannot comply with all the needs of the island itself. So now, uh, after a couple of years, we started from this concept that I showed you before, and we go now to the polygeneration. Unfortunately, I don't have the, the laser here, but uh, you see the, our concept with the heliostat and the tower, we produce heat out of that. Now we have added photovoltaics and wind power, the wind turbine, so we produce electricity and we can store it in bat battery storage. As far as for the so solar radiation and the heat coming from it, we can have, we have a thermal storage uh, unit made of molten salt. We have added also the solar stealing dish, two units of 10 kilowatts, so we can store the heat uh, store the electricity directly to batteries. So solar concentration on the right hand side and classic renewable on the left hand side. So two types of storage, um, one electrochemical and the other one thermal. Um, afterwards, based on that, also, uh, sorry, for regarding the solar steering dish, we can, uh, we're operating in now producing electricity, but we can also co-generate co heat at low temperature, so below 90 degrees. So then we can use uh, the batteries to directly supply our electricity needs, or we can use the thermal, uh, or we can send it to the grid, or in the thermal uh, storage energy, we can use it for different kind of uh, thermal applications. So in our case, we produce electricity via a power block, then we can also use this heat to supply heat to the um, multi-effect distillation unit that you're going to see tomorrow and the forward osmosis. So this is the exhaust heat remaining after the turbine of the ranking cycle. We can use this heat for heating and cooling in the, the buildings and or for the industry. And this is our, uh, basically, uh, at least our goal with the upgrade of Proteas. So here are all the components. So the PVs, uh, 10 kilowatt peak of them, they are being sent directly to the EAC grid, means the Electricity Authority of Cyprus. That was like more than 12 years ago. So the scheme was not very good. Basically, we produced the electricity. Whatever surplus is produced, it's lost, net loss for us. Then we have uh, an inverter, in island, island inverter. So we send uh, both the electricity from PV fields and from the wind turbine down there. Then these units are connected to batteries, the inverter, via the inverter. So you see one is directly through the wind and one just after the inverter. They, we have also a BSRN station, so a baseline surface radiation network station, which is a special network in where there are few affiliated in the world where we have a really um, high level of uh, precision data. Then there is the molten salt tank, so this is our thermal storage unit. We have also uh, then the classical CSP um, components like the central receiver, with a heat capacity of 150 uh, kilowatts and a steam turbine. So this is what our microgrid is made of so far. So the pictures, I have to acknowledge that these, they have been taken by an intern who is working there uh, from UK, uh, Konstantinos. <laughs> so all the credits to him. Uh, we are using also uh, modeling capacity to have uh, to predict on based on the typical meteorological year how much power we can produce so we have here summarized all the components we have put them in simulation stu studio do you know this uh, software transis are you familiar with it it's a multi multi physics 
uh, energy uh, simulator that is able basically to give uh, the output of uh, the production on a typical based on a typical m uh, meteorological year. So we use also the data of the BSRN. So our idea is that from uh, the components we have, we will identify them, we'll put them in Transys. Transys has already its built-in library, but we correct the components to have better and more accurate predictions. And you will see why it's important to do that. So we have our uh, the database that is coming from uh, the BSRN. So we use the weather data we correlate them to the actual power of each component in order to rectify our components in transits. We have developed our own uh, SCADA system with LabVIEW. So we have the acquisition of uh, the p also of the power of each element. And we're doing also some offline uh, calculation and also for the, notably for the uh, solar inc incidence angle. For that, we're using the data of the National Oce uh, Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration in the United States. So there is a lot of there are a lot of calculations behind, but it's very important to know where the sun is because this has an impact on the solar radiation and the angle the, the angle of incidence on the PVs, but also on the heliostats. And we do our, all our merging in MATLAB. Uh, why is it important to to correlate? our simulation to what is being produced is as you see here. Basically, uh, there are standard components in the library, and this is the case for all the, the software that may be on the market. And then you realize that it's not perfectly matching what we produce in reality. So we just build some correlations. We do the same for the wind. So you have the here in, um, in black, dot you can see what has been promoted by the manufacturer in terms of power output but you see the trend is much lower so this is something important to be taken into account um, in our modeling and you can see also uh, the correlation we did offline we have also a subcomponent that is uh, for the dishes so you see them uh, dish telling so the dish engine base engines they have they are almost 300 years a year old in terms of technology, but they, so far they are not really used because of the fact uh, mainly that they are using helium, helium as a, as a working fluid inside. And as you know, uh, helium is uh, really is subjected to, to leakage due to the fact that it's a very small molecule. So you can see, for instance, the production of all our system uh, here during, uh, that was on the 9th of, um, of December. So regarding our uh, thermal storage, we have uh, two uh, sets of batteries, one for the wind and one for the inverter. And also we have this big tank there, which is powered by electric heaters. This one, so molten salts. We have five heaters inside. And they maintain the, the salt in liquid phase, which is something that is very important when we work in CSP especially for the pump, for the piping, we need to make sure that we can pump the fluid and it's not stuck into the piping. So, thermally, you see we have 850 kilowatt thermal, depending on the liberty that we give to ourselves for the operation. Uh, you can see here the heater, uh, the tank, after its installation, without the, the insulation and the cladding. So, Basically, we produce heat for this tank via two modes. First, from the receiver there, but also from electricity via the batteries from our microgrid. So you can see some weather data. I will not go into the details, but what is very important is that you see here in December, the other production stays low, but compared to, for instance, what has been discussed by Professor uh, Parelli this morning, is that in the summer, this, we have overproduction. 
and we see it here. We see it here also in our case. So this is something that uh, is important to consider when we deal with storage, is that in reality, a lot of the, the, well, it depends, but a major part, or let's say a big minor part of what we produce sometimes has to be curtailed out. So um, we have been so developing our own modeling with uh, retrofitting from the real data. And for instance, in the case of Proteas, for the production of electricity via the turbine, which is our main purpose, we can see that electricity at the end is produced in this uh, in kilowatt hour per day for each month. You can see this amount, so there is a big discrepancy between the summer and the winter. And we don't see it here clearly, but the dark green is what has been lost. If we, because we overproduce basically. So afterwards you can see the solar radiation uh, so the global and the direct, and as well as the wind speed, the average per, per day for each month. You can see the production on top right of, of the PVs, the two system of PVs, the dishes, so the parabolic dish, and the wind turbine. And at the end, for each month, we can see the heat from the tank, where it's coming from. So this is Originally, our aim has, it has been designed as for the cogeneration of uh, electricity with desalinated water. So here, the heat going to the molten salt into the tank. And this is given by our heaters. Basically, the heaters immersed in, they help us to maintain the salt at the friendly temperature. And we can recover part of the electricity that ha has been produced on site for the purpose of the turbine at the end. Um, I will not go into details because this is about storage and you, I mean, you're the specialist about storage, but, um, and also going to the, let's say, to the environmental considerations, CSP, solar concentration power, has better impacts than PVs, for instance, because our main competitor is the PV. Uh, solar concentration is very costly in terms of uh, capital cost, so it's very expensive compared to PV that we import from abroad. But what uh, is usually neglected is that the CSP already comes for minor added value with a thermal storage unit in. But PVs, it's only the produce, production of PVs. It produces, it's it's good for politicians because we put it in front of the sun, it produces electricity. We don't care about um, how much and when. So that's a big issue because PVs without considering the storage, for me, it makes no sense. So we see the case of, uh, for instance, here of uh, California, where we have the classical duck shape, which, so this is uh, for winter month, you see that natural gas has to ramp up quite fast in order to respond to the decrease of solar. But we have to understand that when here we have low natural gas, maybe several factories, they have to stay in standby. And being in standby means still emitting. So PVs and wind can only work if they are uh, power plants, diesel or whatever, that are ready to start. In, in order for them to be ready to start, it means that it's not on and off. They have to be in standby and to emit. So we have to have emissions just to be sure that our PVs are operating and the wind as well. And in the summer, it's even more, as you can see. So um, that's why energy and not only power should be considered. So this is something that has to be understood that, that the storage has to be integrated when it goes to comparing the different uh, renewables. So in order to be fair, because our main competitor is clearly PV, we should consider the CSP with its power, the thermal energy storage, and the classic ranking cycle versus PVs plus, plus the electrochemical 
base battery. At the end, they all produce electricity. But if we consider that, first, it's mo much more fair in terms of, um, of uh, cost comparison and also in terms of uh, environmental impacts. So Manuel presented a lot of these aspects, so I will not go into the details, but um, lithium, uh, it's very hard to find it uh, as it is in the nature because uh, it's really uh, highly, uh, it's highly reactive. It can be flammable. Um, also, the techniques to extract lithium to the environment are not so friendly, not at all. Uh, we need to drill and pump to the surface also then the, the mud and uh, put it into reservoirs for further evaporation in open air ponds. Uh, this requires some months to several years to, for the process to be completed. I took that uh, from uh, the publication, what is lithium extraction and how does it work? Uh, it uses uh, reverse osmosis to speed up the, re the process, so we need the energy. We need energy to do that. Uh, we send a mixture of manganese, potassium, borax, and lithium salts. Uh, it requires chemical treatment with solvent and re reagent to isolate the byproducts by precipitation. And then we need to filtrate to extract the lithium and reinjection of the brine into the ground. Uh, lithium as well is a limited resource and it's the same. Uh, so speaking about renewables, we produce renewable uh, energy, but if the storage medium is limited, we're just shifting the issue of fossil fuels from one side to, other, to the other one. Um, there is also contamination of all the local environment, the water and the air. This has been uh, reported in Chile, Argentina, and Tibet. In Argentina, they, they had some rivers that were turning blue just after uh, the, the mining. There is an interesting case in Australia where only 2% of uh, the 3,300 tons of lithium uh, waste is recycled. It's not really, it's, it's not, let's say, maybe the technique is mature, but it's not well processed yet. And usually all these devices, they end up in landfills until they get processed or not. And also the lithium cathodes degrade over time and they cannot be placed into new batteries. So that's why I think that when it goes to renewable, it's very important to consider the storage. I'm not a specialist in storage. I'm more coming from the, let's say, the, the power production, but the two of them have to go together and in hand, and to take all the aspect of sustainability inside. And this, is, uh, this should uh, lead to guidelines for the decision makers. So tomorrow I will see you at Proteas, and uh, I think I'm on time, and if you have any question. Thank you.